Hello, everybody, and welcome good back. Morning, good afternoon. morning. Good morning. Good yeah, Good afternoon. Depending on we where you have are. something very special for you today. We have a very special guest here, my brother, Greg Griffin. Let me introduce you to Pastor Greg Griffin. Hey, Greg. Hi, Greg. He's still muted. Uh, we need to get your microphone, Greg. We don't hear you. You're muted. Your microphone is turned off. Let's see if I can unmute it. I got it. There we go. Okay. We're good. I, got it. I was able to control it from here. Sorry, folks. We've got new controls here. This is a, a bit of a new uh, a new arrangement we got. So let me see if we can't maybe get where we've got a little bit more room. There we go. There. So we're not so squished on here. There we go. That's much better. Mm -hmm. So, Greg, welcome. Uh, welcome to our show. And we'd like to introduce you to our audience. This is my brother, Gregory Griffin. And I'll let you take it from there, Greg. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody, or maybe good morning, good evening, depending on where you're at in the world. Um, my name is Greg, and um, I'm an addict. And what does that mean? Whenever you're a drug addict and you're in recovery, you'll always be an addict. I only have a reprieve for this 24-hour period. I was taking a walk probably six months ago with a, a lady friend of mine that I just met. And she, she asked me, she says, Greg, she goes, why do you say you're in recovery? She says, you've, you've been, you know, you haven't used drugs in however many you know years it was since I've used drugs. Um, why do you say you're in recovery? And so I kind of paused and thought for a moment and just tried to wrap my brain around it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so I told her, I said, this is why I said, because one is too many and a thousand is never enough. Wow. So, um, yeah. So what do you, where do you want me to, where do you want me to start? Where do you, well, want, me to start? you want me to start? Well, you know, that's an amazing start at the beginning because so many people feel like, it's a once and done thing. And if they don't do it once and done, then they're just doomed forever. Haven't you run into that? Yeah. Yeah. And it's really sad that people think that just because they fall off the wagon once, it means that they can, that, that they're hopeless and that they can't pick themselves up. And I think it's interesting that you, um, you say of yourself that you are constantly in recovery because what you're doing is you're reminding yourself of that. You're reminding you yourself that, that you are capable of doing better. Yes. Um, now, why did you take why did you take it in the first place? I mean, I'm I'm sure there's a lot of people like me out there who think to themselves, well, but you knew it was a poison. I don't understand. Do you see? Yeah, so you're talking about are you talking about initial drug use initially? Yes, yes. So why did I use to begin with? Is that the question? So you know, I used to begin with, um, out of curiosity, um, maybe mix in a little bit of peer pressure. Not really sure if the peer pressure is it, but curiosity maybe. Um, and from 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 there, it, it just took off. You know, from being this athlete in high school that um, they trained all the time like a madman to now being introduced to marijuana joint. Everybody smokes it, right? Back in high school, you know, at least mm -hmm. probably 25% of high schoolers smoked weed. Right. And so for me, after that, after that initial using, um, and I was around buddies, you know, we used to score a, a lid, a lid then, we called it a lid, it was an ounce back then. And we used to buy joints at school, they were called pinners. You used to pay two or three dollars for the skinny, skinny uh, joint. Great, anyway, can you back away from your microphone a little bit, please? Just back up. There you go. Good. <laughs> now we can hear you. Thanks. Thank you. So anyways, when, when I started smoking pot, what it did was it um, opened the door to me to my new peer group. I was hanging around with a different peer group now. The, you know, they, they used to call the stoners that were behind in our school as D-dorm. D they used to hang out back there and get loaded. So anyways, anyways through that, it opened the door to um, me getting coke, trying methamphetamine mix. We had these things called cross tops, little white pills, had a little cross on the top. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I did those cross tops, it felt like my hair, it felt like electricity was coming out of my hair. It's like really, really, I really liked the way that it felt. 
so anyways, that progressed down the road to um, just various drugs and stuff. Um, right. There, and with that, there, there became legal issues where I started getting uh-huh. in trouble. Where I started getting in trouble for um, using money to go get um, go cop dope, um, I would go to the next door neighbors and break in, break into his house, and I'd t- take his cool his tool tool set and bring it down to wherever I could bring it down to, and I would sell it, so I could um, get money to use. And right. so I didn't have really too many boundaries around that. If I was able to do it, I was I, I did it. You know, it was very you know looking back on it today, something I feel very very bad about. Um, doing, I actually had a chance to um, make amends actually to the next door neighbor when I ran into him while I was running. After he moved away, I was able to make um, some amends with him. Oh, um, wonderful. So, yeah. So anyways, um, as I said, the ante, the ante went up, the more and more trouble that I got into. Um, right. I don't know how far into, you know, my legal history you want me to go. But anyways, it ended up, you know, starting out with county jail for six months. And then then from there, it was a year in county jail. And then from there, I went up to um, Nevada, up to Lake Tahoe, Reno, Nevada, um, there and um, wrote a series of checks over a week in a drunken weekend where, I, where all I was doing was drinking and gambling and was able to write these checks, checking into the casino, uh, right. checking hotel my attic mine and my own cleverness which was crazy because i was bound to get caught doing this was i would take checks that i got and i couldn't cash them at a cashier's place because a couple weeks before that um we ran that out to where they wouldn't cash any checks for us so what my brilliant mind did was i checked in to um the hotel let's say caesar's palace in uh lake tahoe and i would check in for four nights um in the afternoon and then in the evening at 2 a.m. I would go to the desk and set an emergency in the family. And so what they had to do is they had to give me back three nights of a suite in a suite that I, that I was staying in at $200 a night. They had to give me back $600 cash because they treat, treated it like cash. So anyways, that ran out. I ended up going to County jail security guards surrounded me and all. Um, I had two fake IDs. I had one of my, not my brother, David, my other brother, Mike, I had his ID and somebody else's ID. Oh my goodness. And so when security caught up, up with me and they found these IDs on me, they said, well, you're not this. Who's this guy? Has your last name? So that's my brother. And who's this other guy? So anyways, um, that happens. I didn't really realize how much trouble I was in at the time that right. for writing checks. Each check in the state of Nevada carried one to 10 years in the penitentiary. Wow. I plead bargain to one check. So writing the check at the, um, at the hotel, one check is what I plan to get to see. And they gave me five years in the state prison for that. Wow. So, so yeah, that was pretty, um, it was, it was, you would think, you would think that it would have gotten my attention. You would have thought that. Right. And so as, 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 as it was, I was in prison, I think for, for two years and my brother, David, who is now interviewing me with his lovely wife, Leslie, my brother David came to me and he said, um, you need to go to a drug treatment program, Greg. I'm willing to put up, you know, $3,000, whatever it was, David. I don't know what it was. I still owe it to you this day, even though that you swore it off and said we're even at whatever point in time. Maybe, you know, we'll see. Anyways, um, doesn't matter, Greg. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So um, anyways, I went to a drug program. David paid my entry fee. Um, stayed there six months, you know, left prematurely again. They thought I had a foundation underneath me. Um, it was only a matter of time until I started using again because I had nothing in place. I had I had nowhere to go, no no new friends to um, to hang out with. So I went back to my old ways again. And so, anyways, um, um, I violated my parole, which was in California, and I was instructed to go back to Nevada. This is 1989. So I went back to Nevada and uh, I was supposed to go report to the parole, parole department, but I didn't. So I stayed there, mm-hmm. started drinking and using again, went to Las Vegas from there. And um, that's when I was introduced to heroin in 1991 in Las Vegas, wow. Nevada. So coming from this guy that was smoking weed um, back in what would have been 1977, which people say, um, you know, 
there's gateway drugs that lead to stuff. So for 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 me, it was either pot. No, it's either it was either cigarettes, alcohol, um, and pot. Pot. Yes, that's what. It was. Sorry about that. So, anyways, for me, it was marijuana that led led to that. That actually set off the chain of events where it slowly and gradually it um, ended up me trying heroin. Didn't get strung out right away. I kind of liked the way it felt, except it made me itchy. And before I know it, I was hanging out with a buddy of mine that was an addict. And before I knew it, I had I had a, a heroin habit. Wow. So, um, yeah, and it was, um, yeah, it was. When I see, I work at a drug and alcohol program now, and and you know, I see clients there and talk to them, and um, they were heroin addicts, right? And so, you know, they didn't have any motivation for treatment or anything. I says, if you put in half the energy into your recovery right now as you did into your addiction you, you you're going to be okay because being a heroin addict was hard work it was hard work really? i had to have money every single night i had to have money before i went to bed so i had enough to get what my morning wake up which i used to call uh, getting well i would i would describe it as getting well so i'm not dope sick anymore and so then when that happened in the morning, whenever we caught dope and we got well, then that's when the wheels started turning again and where me and my buddy had to decide, what are we going to do today to hustle up the money, you know, to, to, to fix again? And so that was an ongoing, ongoing, ongoing pattern. So, um, so besides, so 91 to 97, um, besides getting um, locked up, got, got caught for paraphernalia, I ended up going, going to um, – uh, county jail for 30 days and another time I got an open container so I went to jail for 14 days so that's a grand total of 44 days so 44 days from 1991 to 1997 there was 44 days during that period that I didn't use heroin that I didn't shoot up I shot up every day several times a day and so um my brother David here that's um um, back then, he, he used to do tours. He speaks uh, seven languages. He, anyways, so he used to check on me because as part of his tour group, um, one, of the, one of the stops was Las Vegas. And so whenever he was in Las Vegas, um, whenever, I, whenever he's in Las Vegas, he tried to, uh, try to check in on me. And it's funny. Here's a little bit of a story about, about Las Vegas and David. Um, one time I was in the Golden Nugget. That's where David used to stay, the Golden Nugget. And so I went to meet him and it was early in the morning. It was like five in the morning or something like that, six in the morning. And so we were in the casino and we were talking about something. And all of a sudden security swooped on us. And so security asked for, you know, asked me what I was doing, going to kick me out. And then David said, what are you going to kick me out to? I, I stay here. And so anyways, they said, well, if this is your brother, you shouldn't be hanging out with him because he's not welcome in this casino and he's not welcome in any of the other casinos around here. So, um, so that was very interesting. So anyways, just fast forward away from my heroin habit and how difficult it was and how tough it was, as you could tell, fixing every single day for, for six years straight, minus mm -hmm. 44 days, um, was hard. So what ended up happening with me was um, I ended, I had pain in my chest one day and me being a heroin addict, I'm not going to go anywhere. I wouldn't even go to, go to the hospital because I thought I was going to be dope sick there, not knowing that they would give me methadone or whatever they're going to give me or uh, whatever it was they were going to give me to keep me from... Um, being dope sick. Anyway, so I ended up in the hospital. I had these pains, pain in my chest. I it was my heart. I didn't know. And so it wasn't my heart. I had to call, end up calling an ambulance for myself, went to the hospital to find out that my um, left lung was totally full of fluid, infectious fluid. And so um, they admitted me to the hospital, obviously, um, tried to drain my lung. Um, I was in the hospital for two months before they ended up going into my lung one last time to see what was going on. I had to have surgery. Then they had to go in my lung and scrape it out. All this just nasty stuff. Um, so anyways, you know, I, if I didn't have any family or anywhere to go, I would have ended up dying um, at, at, at the time of my discharge from the hospital. I would, I would have ended up dying because I would have just left the hospital like I did at county jails. And first thing I do when I get out is I fix. How crazy is that? Right. So what ended up happening was, is my brother David um, 
first, anyways, I didn't know this behind the scenes of me being. I was in the in the hospital under Nancy Johansson. Nancy was my was my. Um, I was a legend in my own mind, is what I was. Nancy Johansson. I was a legend in my own mind. Um, so, anyways, um, the hospital social worker was in constant contact with my mom, daily contact with my mom. Behind the scenes, I had no idea that this was going on. And so mom would ask, mom would ask um, the doctor, um, should we come? Should we come? Because I mean, I was like on the brink of dying. And so the doctor said, well, not yet. And so anyways, um, I have this surgery and um, for all the dirt and all the shit, the, the, my, my mom and dad, through the years, the hell I brought my mom through, from going to visit her son in Nevada State Prison, knowing they had to get on a plane, mom and dad they had to get on a plane in Oakland, fly to the airport in Las Vegas, rent a car, and um, drive up to prison to see me with all these gun towers and razor wire and all this stuff. I later talked to my mom about this once I got clean and went home, and I'll tell you what they did for me once I got out of the hospital. Um, you know, it must have been horrible, you know, to, to see your son in, in that position. But, you know, I put myself there. So anyways, um, fast forward to um, the hospital in 1997. So what ends up happening is, is I, when I was going to be discharged, um, I was going to be discharged to go home to my parents, my mom and my dad. That's why I was going into my mom and all the shit I brought her through. And she here, she's taking this heroin addict back in. Wrap your mind, wrap your mind around this. When I got discharged from the hospital in 1997, I weighed 124 pounds. Yep. I was, and I'm six foot. Yep. So the plan was to go back home to my parents who basically I brought through hell and back. Um, I brought them through hell and back. So anyways, um, mom bought a plane ticket one way back home. And little did I know um, uh, that the, they were said that the hospital was to shuttle me from the hospital to the airport. Once I got to the airport, there's my brother, David. I had no idea that my brother, David, was waiting for me there. To make sure I got on the damn plane instead of trying to get that ticket and hawk it so I can get some more dope, right? That's eight, correct. Eight days after being um, released out of the hospital. So, anyways, they 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 um, you know they actually had to wait a few days before they put me on a plane because of the pneumonia that I had in the surgery and the and the pressure I guess from the plane. So, anyways, I, I was sent home to. Um, is this what we're doing? We had mentioned before that you guys were going to interview me. So my right. yes, we are. You're Go doing ahead. Great You're doing stuff. great, Greg. We're all we're all absolutely riveted by your story. I don't have okay. to. Ask well, I kind of feel like I kind of feel like you know me. Just a little fast for a little information for the people out there that might be watching. Hopefully, people are watching this because the end result to this is. It's, oh, there are Greg. There are a lot oh, of people watching lot of people this right here. now. We the are right now. This, the Go end ahead. result to all this right here is that there's hope. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go chronologically go through what happened from Vegas, from my Vegas years. I call them my Vegas years. I call them my Yancey years, Yancey, Y-A-N-C-Y. -Y. The way I got that handle of Yancey was when I first got to Las Vegas before I started shooting dope, I just drank a little bit. You know, I was 29 years old, drank a little bit and stuff before I got started on heroin. I played poker every single day. And so I was called Yancey because there was a riverboat gambler called Yancey Johansson. I forgot the name. Oh. So anyways, so anyways you, you know, it's funny because my brother David, when he seen me after I've came up, uh, I've come home um, to get rehabilitated and stuff um, after Vegas, my brother would bring up the name Yancey. Well, Yancey, Yancey's gone now. You know, Yancey, you put Yancey to bed when you, when you left Las Vegas. My screen just changed. Is that right? My screen just yeah, changed. Yeah, that's exactly right, Greg. We just made you big. Say it again? Made me big? We just made you bigger. You made me bigger. Okay. I like bigger. I guess I'm, I depend, I guess. Um, so anyways, um, I got on the airplane and um, is it supposed to be like this right here? Me being bigger? Yeah, that's correct. I'll, I, I'll take care of it. Just trust it, Greg. Okay. All right. So anyways, um, I fly home to California. Mom and dad picked me up from the um, airport and I come home. Coming home to my childhood house, the only house I've ever known, um, with some neighbors still in place, 
over there when I was, you know, going through junior high or high school. And I remember very vividly that Bob Burgess, who was a pastor at a, at a church um, by where we lived, later on, after I got a little bit more healthy, Bob, you, she, Bob would tell me, he says, boy, I was worried about you. He says, you looked like death warmed over. Couldn't believe that he said that. You looked like oh, death. Oh, you did, Greg. When, when I put you on the plane at the airport, I, I thought we were going to lose you. You were really, really, really bad off. Well, you yeah. weigh, what, 180 pounds now? Yeah, yeah. I actually have gotten up. Well, actually, my high, my highest uh, weight since I've been back was 211, which is too heavy for me, but, you know. Right. Because if you you know if you work on it and stuff, you change your body, you change your life, right? That's right. Um, so, anyways, David, it's, um, I, you know, I didn't really know that and see that through your eyes um, about that. You know, um, you thought you were going to lose me. Um, I mean, all I had to do is wrap my brain around 124 pounds. And my sick head. This is what my thoughts were when I went back to my childhood home. I thought I was going to go there and get cleaned up and put some weight on it, be better, and got to go to Las Vegas or someplace like that, you know, because I'm the kind of guy that loved, I love the action. I like the action. Right. I want to be in the mix. I want to be in the action. Right. And, and so little did I know, um, little did I know then at that time, this was, I came home, I came home, um, I actually came home May, May 10th of 1997. It was my, my parents' um, anniversary. Today I came home, and so they they, they spent um, um, they spent uh, their anniversary, you know, taking care of their son who just came home weighing 124 pounds. Um, anyways, let me fast forward. So, anyways, I didn't know what I was going to do. I thought that you know I was going to go back to Las Vegas and stuff. And as time went on, I started putting weight on and started feeling better and stronger. Um, I you know I realized that I was going to stay in California. So what my next thing was, is I had to decide what I was going to do for a living and how I was going to support, you know, myself as working in the world. Um, let me skip back um, a couple months before that, before that about going and um, getting back into the workforce. So sure. I'm, home, well, right? I'm home now there, you know, convales convalescing, going to, um, so finally, whenever I was ready to go out, maybe in public, um, I went with my dad um, and um, went to my uh, my brother-in-law, Bob, my brother-in-law, Bob, who I ended up coaching literally with a couple years down the road from now. But I remember when I came home, Bob and another coach, um, they coached both my nephews. And so they were in the TOC. They were in the Tournament of Champions. And I was able to go see that. And it was, it was really cool and stuff. And so... Um, Anyways, around that time, um, probably, I don't know, three months after I was back, um, my mom received in the mail, or my mom and dad, the, what came in the mail was a, um, a postcard type flyer. And on it, it said, celebrate recovery um, at some church that was in the area, November 4th, you know, celebrate recovery and said groups, small groups, this group, all that. So anyways, it just sat there. My mom, it was on the coffee table in the back room where we watched TV at. Um, so anyways, time went on and time went on. I still remember the date vividly in my head. It was November 4th, 1997. And so when we were about a week away from that date, um, I told my mom, I says, mom, I said, I see that you put this thing here. And I said, there's a reason it's not in the recycle. And there's a reason that it wasn't thrown aside this stupid, crazy idea that I was going to get clean and go back to Las Vegas or stuff like that, you know. Drug addiction is a very, very selfish um, just to maybe draw closer to God. And, um, you, you know, just, you know, I needed that. I needed some type of something to sustain me and to be able to do something I can believe in, you know, outside of myself or outside this stupid, crazy idea that I was going to get clean and go back to Las Vegas or stuff like that. You know, Dr drug addiction is a very, very selfish, um, just a very selfish thing that, you know, we hurt the ones that we love. Um, so obviously I had hurt mom and dad really, really bad. So anyways, I told mom, I says, yeah, we'll go to that. And so she wanted to go with me to support me. She was going to go to support me. Little, no, little did she know she was going to get her own help. Um, so the first couple of weeks was kind of like in a sanctuary area where things were discussed about recovery and so on and so forth. And so anyways, 
they had to like get groups of people like the group I was going to be in. Like, Greg, before we go on, before we go on too much, what was it like to see that little thing laying out there that mom left for you on the on the the dresser there for you to see on the coffee table? It was just like mom, passive aggressive. <laughs> mom is passive aggressive. She was to the day that she died. God bless her. She died. My mom. My mom died this year. And and, and yeah, and, and from from sticking needles in my arm, that side of my recovery, being a heroin addict, and all that stuff in my past. It's really really strange because wow. whenever I got clean, I was home for a while, and so away from heroin and all that. My clean and sober date then of heroin. Was May 29th, 1997. My mom, my mom passed away this year on May 29th. Tell me that isn't a God thing. Yeah. So let me back up a little bit now. Um, where, where, um, um, where we were, okay, we we had this all very. Mom, mom was the key to your recovery, really, wasn't she? Mom and dad, you know. Excuse me. Um, what would you say? What would you say was it that was really the key to your turning things around? Going to celebrate recovery, probably right. getting close to God, going to those groups, individual groups and stuff. And um, little did mom know there were several groups there that celebrate recovery was from uh-huh. wasn't just chemical dependency or sex addiction or overeaters e- e- eating disorder or all the disorders that you can imagine i mean they can only have so many years but mom's is codependency right so while i was going to my chemical dependency group mom was going to codependency group and it was really good for her it was really really good for her. and that was my turning point then was whenever i went to celebrate recovery um, Greg, can you hold on just one second? I'd like to welcome the people on YouTube, on our YouTube channel that are watching us, that are here now. I'm really, really sorry. I forgot to turn on the event earlier. Uh, someone just mentioned it in the chat, and we've now fixed that problem. So I believe, yes, see, also our people from the YouTube event are also there. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for your patience. We'll be restreaming this again. I'll download it from somewhere else so we get the full video, including this part. So. Mm-hmm. Greg, this is Greg Griffin, my brother, who's here with us. He's been telling us his life story. He uh, told us about what happened in Las Vegas and about how his turning point came when he came home. He'd had pneumonia and how uh, how he's turning his life around. And he was just talking about how we lost our mom this year and is about to tell us more about his recovery and how he's dedicated his life to helping others to recover as well. So here's Greg. Okay. I was just mentioning that my mom... My mom, when my mom died this year on May 29th, it was the same uh, date where I started to stop sticking needles in my arm pretty much. Um, so it was very, you know, it was a God thing that, that things happened at that, you know, in that timing of it. Um, so anyways, mom, you know, went to her groups, um, her group, and, you know, I continued my group. And at that point in time, I had to, you know, think about what I was going to actually do for a living. Before I get into that, not just mom, mom just wasn't in that um, equation of, of, of healing and of um, drawing closer to, to God. Um, my dad, who was an atheist, um, was an atheist entire life. I remember us going to church on Sundays. Mom would bring. Uh, I remember that, um, too, Greg. He, she couldn't. There's no way we could get dad to go with us. No, dad was watching football, you know, of course. I want to see how much for my my own damn self, for granted out loud. Um, but anyways. Um, of course, it was good for you. Yeah. So anyways, um, dad had no choice, really. This is when fast forward to 97, 98, 99, my early years in recovery. Um, my father basically had no choice. He had a choice, but you know, this is son coming home, heroin addict, 124 pounds, um, mom, you know, taking me and mom getting all of her own personal, um, her own personal help, setting boundaries with dad or whatever, however that looked, whatever, how that looked um, for her, was where she was at in her recovery, really, it was in her recovery as well. Um, got my dad's attention and my dad started going to church and, um, started going to church on a regular basis. He became um, um, really good friends with some people he met at church. 
Um, and I remember seeing my dad. Um, I was sitting a little bit behind and my mom and dad were sitting together and there's a period of time before the um, me- uh, sermon or message of the day was um, spoken that there was worship time where the, the music would play and we were, we were Baptists. So, I mean, out there Baptists. And so hands in the air, you know, eyes to the heavens, uh, you know, in worship. And here's my father um, standing there, arms and hands extended up in the air towards God. And it was just amazing. It was amazing to see that. Celebrating your recovery, Greg. Yes. And moms too. Right. You right. know, so anyways, about that time, we're talking about what happened in my life. I, I, um, I had to decide what I wanted to do for a living. You know, I, I had to nix my plan of going back to Vegas and hustling and shooting dope again. Go figure. I mean, how crazy of a thought is that to go back to that? So anyways, I had to decide what I wanted to do with my life. And so from going to those groups, I really connected with the man, the, the man, John Nielsen is his name. And he's the one that spearheaded um, um, Celebrate Recovery and pretty much turned him to my spiritual sponsor. Kind of took me under his, took me in and put me under his wing and just kind of walked beside me, you know. And I remember vividly one of the things that he told me about things. He says, Greg, it's, it's, it's not that difficult. He says, you've got to change playgrounds and playmates. And that really resonated for me because to this very day, um, I work as a, a substance abuse counselor. Now I work in a different, um, have a little bit of a different function than I've had. been there for 21 years. Um, but anyways, I mean, you know, the clients going through there that, are, that, are, that, you know, desire to be clean and sober and lead a clean and sober life, basically that in whatever form or fashion that changing playgrounds and playmates has, it's, it's like one of the number one things somebody gets in clean time. You can't go back to the old neighborhood where the people are doing the same things, you know, and you can't right. go out with the friends, you know, take all those phone numbers, take all those, delete all those phone numbers on your cell phone. Why do you? Yeah. Yeah, Where are you exactly. What for? What for? Yep. So anyways, I went to school um, uh, for two years to get, you know, once again, thank m- mom and dad. Um, they paid my way to school, you know, for me to be able to get a career and um, move forward in life, and um, which I'm really, really grateful for um, now. And so right now I'm at the point where I'm fast forwarding. I'm almost to the point where I'm going to maybe um, be done with my story here in a second. And you can take it from there, David and Leslie. But um, anyways, um, David and Leslie were, were, were at our house um, last, trying to think. I want to I want to interrupt you for just a second to read you a few of the comments that are coming in, Greg. Okay. Uh, Violet Voyager says, "My little brother passed, and I just get very wide eyed then. So in a way, his passing and a little divine intervention was a turning point." Hi, Greg. Uh, Zeldin Gariga wants to know: Was the recovery group based on the twelve step group? Uh, Thomas says in old, no, let's see, what's up, amigos? Ah, Elmar says, I'm also in recovery, clean from heroin and crack for over 20 years. And Synthetic Future says, he's speaking of things many of us have gone through, rich, emotional, and valuable experiences, charismatic backgrounds, JW, et cetera, are common in this path. Me too, mom and dads are so wonderful. I was always abstinent for alcohol, drugs, into a certain amount also for sex, I get psychopharmaceutica for free a lot. So I was dying when I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. So Greg, there are a lot of people that are here right now and that are hanging on your every word and they're, they're finding hope in your message. What would you say to them? Those that are here today and that are feeling hopeless right now, there is someone right now for sure out there who's using and feeling hopeless and is here looking for a way out. What do you have to say to him today, Greg? Well, today at this very moment, um, looking for um, some comfort or looking for some place he can be to where he doesn't put himself in a position to drink or use today, um, 
you know, this is mixed in with the question about the 12, 12 step programs. This is a mixture of that. Um, the thing about 12 step programs is they're out there. They're every day. They're, they're, they're several times a day. Um, I know just from AA and NA, they have um, pamphlets and flyers, or you can get on the phone actually and call Narcotics Anonymous um, Hotline or Alcoholics Anonymous Hotline, and they can tell you where a meeting's at. When is the next meeting in your area? You know, if you got to drive 30 miles, you got to drive 30 miles. How many times have you d- drove 30 or 40 or 60, 100 miles to go get dope? You know, right. to use? so, you know, my suggestion for the time being would be find a 12 step meeting and go. You know, the, you know, you just don't drink or use, or if you did use a little bit, you can't share. You, you can't share anything if you're under the influence. But you can go there. You can raise your hand. You can say, "I'm an addict or I'm an alcoholic, and I'm struggling, and I need support. I need support. I don't know what to do." And I guarantee you, somebody's going to come up to you after the meeting and talk to you. Right. And I think it's a daily reprieve. Um, that's 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 what I would suggest. Um, I'm going to share some of the end with a little little handout um, uh, to take with you kind of thing at the end of um, this webinar, and, and it basically is five five challenges of early recovery. You'll see it at the end, and it has some really good information on on that too, as far as being lonely and kind of being in your own thing. Wonderful, Greg. What was you said? There was another question. Was it the 12 step? Or was the question about 12 step? Well, uh, was, is it easy to make friends and, and change who you're hanging out with? Because, you know, people, you want to change who you're around. That's a really important thing that you mentioned to us. So these people who are in recovery, they're, they're different. They're, they're not like your old addict friends. They're, they're new. They're, they're different. They, they have this willpower to succeed and, and to do better, and they are doing better. And you all support your, each other, right? Absolutely. absolutely. And this is the thing I talk to clients today where, 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 where I work. I do kind of like the exercise program at a drug uh, program. There's two of them, long-term, short-term program. And I, I'm lucky enough to be able to go there Monday through Friday um, and, and be able to take both. Um, both programs to the Cal Berkeley track. We, we're, we're a half of a block away from the, the programs, a half of a block away from the Cal Berkeley track. And so exercise is really, really important, you guys out there. I mean, that's something that you can incorporate. So your question was, is, was were, what did you ask about 12 step? Oh, I'm making new friends. Right. How do you make new friends? Right. So, right. So, that's really important, Greg. That's something you said that I, I think is really, really key. And, you know, of course, if you go back to the same neighborhood and you're going back to the same people you've been hanging out with who are still using, you're going to use. Absolutely. So going from people who are using in your immediate community to go, building community mm-hmm. with people who are already in recovery is huge. Yes. And, and so this is what I suggest. And this is Hammer. I'm not a 12 step Nazi or anything like that. I, I believe in it because of the fact of what you're speaking of right now, David. Um, you, uh, you know, I don't, I don't hammer it. You got to do this. You got to do that. You know, you're going to die. You know, if, if you don't do this, the thing about 12 step is, is um, it's what we we're just talking about as far as making new friends. Um, if you go to a 12 step meeting, what I would suggest that so we're talking about transitioning from, first of all, delete all the numbers of the connections and the people that, um, um, that you used to talk to just because you're there, you're not around anymore. Forget about it. You don't, you don't need those folks. You don't need those people anyways. They're just going to drag you down. So when you go to a 12 step meeting, um, there's a thing called sponsorship and 12 step, you get a sponsor. It's kind of like I said, John Nelson, the celebrate recovery. He was mm-hmm. a spiritual leader. He was a spiritual leader to me, but you need to go to a meeting, several meetings to get that, just to get that support, raise your hand, and say, I need, a sp- I'm looking for a sponsor, whether it's a temporary sponsor or whatever. And to get a sponsor, what you do is when you go to the meetings, you keep your ears open and listen to, to people that share. And somebody that has clean time, I would suggest at least a year, maybe more clean time. Um, go up and ask them to be your sponsor. If there's meetings, there's sponsorship meetings, especially for that where there's m- several people there that are willing to sponsor new people. So you, you get a sponsor that's been around for a while. What happens is this. The sponsor will introduce you around 
to all of his friends, you know, from, right. you know, in the 12 step community, get a sponsor that, you, that knows a lot of people. You can tell by other people coming up to him and talking to him and casually you see all these, he's, all these people are attracted to him or whatever. He's right. better. You know what you feel and you see it. Right. Right. So right. Uh, get a sponsor. And that's where it begins. He introduces you around. There's so much stuff that is involved in 12 step clean and sober dances, clean and sober softball leagues, clean and sober right. campouts, clean and sober river rafting, you know, all right. this, so it's community building, community building. And, 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 and it's very normal. If there's an eight o'clock uh, meeting at night, AA lasts an hour and a lasts an hour and a half. Um, it's very common that after a meeting, group of people go to the local coffee shop or wherever afterwards to fellowship, to fellowship. Right. And all of a sudden you see this construction worker over here that's been in the union for 25 years. This has got five years clean. You see this, you start talking to these people, you start picking their brain. You start finding out what was it like for you? How did you stay clean in your first month? How did, what did you do to stay clean? Right. You know, start asking people. And that is the beginning of building a foundation of friends ones that actually really care and get you. The other people don't give a shit about you. Right. Right. Well, now I've also heard that it's important when picking out a sponsor that you find someone who is of your same sex, that you don't get into uh, the opposite sex sponsorship because the first thing you need to learn to take care of is yourself. And then you need to learn to take care of a plant. This is when, when I was working with 12 step programs in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, the program that I was working with, they recommended that you first start taking care of a plant. And that as you learn what the plant needs and how to be regular with taking care of the plant, like you're regular taking care of yourself, then you can move up to say a cat or a dog. And then once you've built a relationship with a cat or a dog, then perhaps you're ready for a romantic relationship. But <laughs> I actually have seen problems coming up when someone in recovery finds someone who is absolutely gorgeous of the other sex who is also in recovery. Yes, I want that to be my sponsor. I, I've seen that train wreck before, and I really <laughs> caution people against it. It, it, can, it can be beautiful. It can be beautiful. Uh, I didn't get to see that part of it. Yeah, it's um, for obvious reasons. Um, we don't want the male, female or that, you know, for, for obvious reasons. Um, also, I mean, in 12 step, one of the one of the they have meetings that are stag, they have the, you can look for stag meetings, which um, are men only uh -huh. meetings where you can go to to be able to talk about stuff. That, and you know, Right. And if you accidentally walk into a stag meeting or a doe meeting, they're very, they're very kind. They'll let you stay, but you're not allowed to say anything that I, I, yeah, there's a lot of, there's so many good 12 step programs out there. Um, and when I was in Omaha, Nebraska, there was a meeting every three hours, seven days a week somewhere. Right. Yeah. They have them all over the place everywhere. That's well, right. Get dropped, up for, get dropped off from a helicopter in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I guarantee you, you go someplace, go to the phone book, call the NA hotline or AA hotline, and you'll find a meeting somewhere in that town. Almost right. any town around that. Um, there's me. It's amazing how far that it's uh, how far it's grown. And yet, and yet, and yet, it was faith-based recovery that turned you around. If I understand you correctly, with the Salt Lake right. Church. Yes. Now, how is that different from the 12 step program? Well, it's different from the 12 step program in, in, in the manner that um, the higher power, you know, I've heard it said in AA meetings, oh, if you're higher power, you can even make a you know, doorknob your higher power. And there's acronyms, group of drunks, right? Good, good you know, uh, um, got good orderly direction. There's these acronyms for um, mm -hmm. the God thing. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is, is the higher power. And so right. that's what's hard. Um, that's what's, you know, you know, some people get stuck on, stuck on the God, the God stuff, because it's all over the place. Um, you know, realize that we were, um, um, what was the step two? Came to believe, came to believe, believe that power greater than ourselves can restore us to right. sanity. People get led down that. People get led down that road. Some people get um, don't like it. They back off. They 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 you know say see that won't work. 
you know now nowadays they have they have a life ring there's 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 12 they have a life ring which is a program you know they don't god's not in, in it um there's um it used to be called it's now it's called um it used to be called rational recovery now it's called recovery dharma which is a buddhist 12 step oh. meeting that they have um they have ma marijuana anonymous ca cocaine anonymous they have all of it and then venture outside of drugs and alcohol you know overeaters anonymous gambling anonymous you know because because it's been proved to have worked the thing it's not a bad path or a bad way to live your life in general even if you're not an addict you know uh, you know wrote down an inventory of you know everybody that you know i've hurt or harmed you know in your life and and willing to make amends to them you know not a bad idea for for just right living to live your life the right way you go back and you make amends you know i had to do a lot with my mom you yeah. know we would come home on a Tuesday night from Celebrate Recovery, you know, she had her own stuff going on. I had my own stuff going on. I would pull in the driveway and um, the engine was turned off. And, you know, I told mom, you know, it was a fucked up message I got when I was a kid. Children are to be seen and not heard. You know, we had received some fucked up messages. Excuse me. We received some messages that were all okay, you know, growing up. And, you know, she wanted to argue a little bit about it with me. And I said, you know what, Mom, I, I, I don't want to argue about it. I'm just saying it because, you know, it's just been on my mind. And we talked about it in my group and stuff like that. I, I don't mean to be attacking you or anything like that. But it was really good. It really, really helped me build um, a relationship with my mom. You know, it would be in a beautiful relationship with my mom. God bless her that she just passed away, you know, um, to fast forward a little bit, um, you know, with my mom, because, you know, I, I think I've kind of walked, you know, through most of, if you have questions after I'm done, please feel free to ask. Um, but mom, um, mom had been sick for the last year. And bless my, my little sister, Lori's heart. Um, she was there for her every step of the way. And so we came to a point to where we thought we were going to lose mom. Um, so before she died, like, thank God, mom and dad, my mom died May 29th. Mom and dad got to celebrate their 65th wedding anniversary on May the 10th, 19 days before mom died. And it was a God thing, I feel. I feel, feel that they needed it to, you know, some people would ask my mom, what's the key to um, 65 years of marriage? My mom would say, separate beds. <laughs> 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 separate beds, mom said. <laughs> so anyways um mom went to stanford back and forth on these medical things she's you know she had a, she had a, a, a autoimmune um disorder where if she had a surgery or something like that or had anything done to her um she couldn't heal properly and so anyway she was rushed to the hospital in early may me and my sister were there and they brought her in the ambulance and my sister yelled, she's having a stroke she's having a stroke she's having a heart attack actually is what it was they brought her to the hospital. They revived her. She she came out of it. Two days later, she 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 came out of it. And I told her, I said, Mom, I said, Mom, I got to feel what it felt like for you to die because I thought that you, I thought you died. And I said, from this moment forward, you are now my bonus mom. <laughs> and she loved that, the bonus mom. Because she was, you know, and gave me an opportunity, you know, those last few weeks um, to really love her up. I loved on my mom. Love on, love on your family, you know. They're not going to be here forever, you know. And so now we're at a place where, you know, my dad, you know, 65 years married to my, um, my mom, um, currently my father. I mean, he's having a hard time. I mean, 65 years and he's got some dimension stuff going on, you know. And so I'm there for him. I live with my dad. I help take care of him with my sister. Um, and so anyways, I had a moment with him an hour and a half ago, two hours ago. Um, it was a touching moment for me. Um, before, I, you know, I always usually leave a note to tell dad um, where I'm at, you know, where I'm going, when I'll be back. I put my phone number there and Lori, because it's got a little bit of dementia. And, you know, we have a new thing with area codes. You got to dial the area code, area code, even in your same area code. You got to dial the area code first and the number. 
And so we have to write that there and remind dad that, you know, we should do that. So anyways, um, this was at noon. So around 11, I was taken off from the house and I went in, my dad was in bed. And I told dad, I says, I'm going over to Lori and Bob's right now. What are you going over Lori and Bob's right now? I said, I'm going over to Lori and Bob's right now because my bro- David and Leslie are going to interview me or I'm going to get to share my story a little bit. You know, by the way, whenever, when, whenever I found out, you know, I think it was last Thanksgiving, um, that I was going to be able to share my story. When I was invited by David and Leslie to, um, um, to tell my story, it excited me. It excited me. And I said a prayer before I came in that if it could impact just one person, it would be successful. So I told dad, I told dad. Okay, you've impacted more than one person, brother. There are a number of people here. I can feel the spirit of God moving on people through your words, Greg. There are people that are going to be touched. They're coming out of this, watching this different today. I can guarantee it. That's good. That's, that was the hope. That was That's the hope. That's the hope. Um, so anyways, I told dad, I said, um, I'm getting interviewed by David and Leslie, um, you know, telling my story about, you know, my addiction and heroin addiction in Las Vegas and stuff. And I got teared up and just went over and I just hugged my dad up and just told him, thank you for all the stuff that you've done for me. If it wasn't for my mom or my father, I'd be dead right now. I truly believe that. And so, um, yeah, so sobriety is a wonderful thing. Oh, Greg, it's so beautiful. And we're so pleased that you will share this story with us. I'm, I'm sure that there are a lot of people out there who have similar stories, but they don't have the confidence that you do to share this story. Thank you, Greg, for making yourself so vulnerable. There's so many people who are looking for help and looking for hope and, you know, and, and, and you being so honest and so open and so vulnerable is opening the way for people right now in this very moment. Because they can see, they can see that you are like they. And you're not a bullshitter. It's like, there's no lie in you. It doesn't exist at this point. Not anymore. <laughs> when I used to sell the phony jewelry on the streets of Las Vegas, there was a lot of bullshit in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was Yancey. That was Yancey, yes. Not Pastor Greg. Yeah. You know, a lot of it, too, is like Bob's in the room with me right now. Bob is the computer guy, and my brother-in-law, I love him to death. And my sister, Lori, you know, it's just and then dad at home. I mean, you know, I'm surrounded with, you know, love and friends and caring and all that. And it's what life is all about, you know, is relationships. And stuff. So for those out there that are struggling, I mentioned the 12 step stuff. You know, I just, I, you know, when you pick a sponsor, pick somebody, you, you know, you got to remember, you're going to be, there's going to be a, a part of vulnerability to you as you work the steps with your sponsor. Find somebody that you feel like you might be able to open up with and share. Because I'll tell you what, in sharing your hurts, habits, and hangups with somebody, there's power in it. To be able to name it and say it and, and put it out there and, and process it with your sponsor and move through it. There is so much, uh, there's so much power in that, that you let it go. You let it, you know, you let it go. It's gone. It's the past. Move forward. You know? So, yes. Any questions? Are we going to open up for questions or anything, David, with um, anybody? Are we set up to do that or in the chat? Or are we going to be able to open up with anybody to share? Yeah, we, we will in just a second, Greg. Okay. What else right, do you got? See, I'm going to take a look here and see if we've got um, – if we have, all we can do is read their comments. If you have questions, be sure and post them in the comments. Okay. Uh, in this and platform, we can't have them join in with us so easily. Maybe next month. Maybe in next month. Next month's yeah. webinar. Next time, the here. next, the next, the next time, Greg, that you want to come here with us, we're going to do this in a group setting where people can also talk to each other. Mm-hmm. You know, today we thought it was we the best is to do this because you'll reach the largest audience. A lot of people will hear about this and 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 will be moved by your message, I'm sure. And one of the things that I would like to mention is, you know, we've talked about Buddhist recovery, atheist recovery, 12-step recovery, um, Christian recovery. There's also pagan recovery, 
for those people who don't feel comfortable with any of the above that have been mentioned. That's um, right. And, and there's also magical spells that go along with recovery. And there's Buddhist mantras that go along with recovery. And uh, you've described exercise programs that go along with recovery. It's huge. Exercise, if, I could, if I could give somebody, if I could, if I could give um, an addict that's recovering two, um, two um, traits or two things that, to gravitate towards, one of them would be exercise. Um, exercise, you know, where you elevate your heart rate. A row, in a, a row, row, I, well, I was a marathon runner, so I'm privy to the, the aerobic stuff. But it's so good to go out there for anxiety, for a lot of reasons, it tends those muscles up to get it, get out there and breathe, you know, um, at least 25 minutes to be considered really a, a workout. Walking, right. wrist walking is very, very important. And then the number two um, thing is humility. The ability to, to be able to be humble. And um, humility um, is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. Oh. That's a beautiful way to state it. Because I think a lot of people get hung up on humility as a way of beating up on yourself. Or, no. Or, or self-depreciation. No. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less often. Aha. Uh -huh. And and, 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 and and I mean, this is number two. I mean, this is might be my top. She might be my top three. I don't know, but it's just a really, really good thing. You, you know, you're going to a meeting. You're raising your hand. You're getting a sponsor that you can, can connect connect with, right? And you're doing this stuff. You know, being humble and being teach. You know, that's a big one. Humble, being teachable. You know, to be open and willing um, to hear stuff and, and suggestions on, you know, what you should do or could do or think about doing. Because I'll tell you what, guy, it didn't work our way, right? We tried it our way. It didn't work. So, you know, look for another way, you know, and by being humble and teachable, I think that um, you're on your way. Wonderful, Greg. You know, there's one thing that I'd like to, I would like to ask you about, because you mentioned this in your written biography when we were putting the, the page together for recovery. And that is um, the role of adrenaline. Are we talking about, are you, we talking about the addiction, um, about getting involved in addiction because that, are you referring to my part of my autobiography? Okay. Well, let, let, let me, let me just put it this way. You know, I, I know you pretty well, Greg, I've, I've known you through this whole process and you know, when you were a kid, when you were in high school, you were really, really driven. You were four-year letterman, lettered in sports, lettered in wrestling. I mean, you were really, really good at what you did. You really excelled. But you yourself talk about how, for you, what was so important was the adrenaline rush of it. And that's why you liked running marathons and, and, and stuff like that. So I'm wondering um, what role that adrenaline and considering adrenaline might have both in falling into addiction and in recovery. I think for you, for example, I'm sorry you had to have a hip replacement as a result of having run so much, but I think running was a blessing to you. You got a lot of the adrenaline from running that you would have gotten through the addiction. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So you're, you're referring to the transfer of me having that adrenaline in my life in the past and when that adrenaline. So I think what you're talking about, David, is when you're bringing up sports and all that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I used to run and wrestle and competed in sports and stuff, you know, I was driven there as far as, you know, to win, you know, to win the race or to do whatever. And got used to winning. I liked what it felt like. I liked what it felt right. like to win. It was it, it, there was a rush behind that. There was a rush. But, you know, you win a tournament, you're on the top step of the thing. You're getting this little um, olive fed branch, whatever the hell you get. Um, there's there's this cool. There's, it's, it's cool. It's um, there wasn't a feeling like that at that time in my life. It's the best feeling I'd ever felt. So once I smoked that joint and graduated high school and there's no longer any sports to be um, any races to be, you know, run. Um, I really feel like my addiction in the beginning was almost like a, a replacement to that adrenaline. The euphoria that I got 
from doing methamphetamine, the euphoria that I got by doing cocaine, all the, the euphoria in that was wanting to have that feeling again, you know, and we, we, we see how, how far that took me, you know, didn't work. Right, right. Yeah. Wonderful. Are there any more questions? Yeah, and let's see if there are any other questions. I don't see necessarily here a question, but, oh, Greg, you're going to like this. Elmar says, Greg, you are talking to my soul. I am truly moved. Thank you so much. Excuse me. That's quite touching. You know, no, I, I was excited um, all week. I've been excited. You know, me and David were talking about this. Um, we've been talking about it for a while. You know, Leslie actually said that, you know, she teaches or coaches um, people and all that. And she said that she knew that there were people out there that, you know, that needed um, assistance or hope that needed, that, that needed, you know, to have hope, you know, without hope. I mean, you're just going to keep going deeper and deeper. Um, and I got, it got me excited, you know, it got me excited. And so, yeah, it's very cool. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear those. I'll read those afterwards. Is there going to be a place for me to be able to read? Is there going to be a way that I can communicate um, individually with some individually with these people? Next, next time, not this time, Greg. On this platform, it's not really possible. You can okay. see the comments. They're on the side there. If you click to the side on the comments, there's a comments button on the side of your screen. Oh, God, I see them. And then you can see the comments yourself there. Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll take time to read these after. I'm just looking at a couple. Oh, we appreciate you, Greg. We appreciate your being here and appreciate your sharing. I'm I'm so happy that something good has come out of this because even though it was so painful and everything that you went through and nearly losing your life, you come out of this with such valuable life experience that can touch the lives of so many people. And in fact, in the last 20 years, has touched the lives of so many people if, as you've been working uh, as a drug and rehab counselor. Yeah, I'm also a real estate agent. Just throwing this in there because I have a comment to say about the drug and alcohol um, counselor. Uh, Greg, you lost your mic for some reason. We can hardly hear you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? You're fine. You're fine. You're it was fine. me. Sorry. Can you hear me now? You're can fine. You me now? That was mine. I'm my, my bad. My bad. Go ahead. Uh, huh. Um, I forget what I said. Um, whenever I talk about um, the drug and alcohol program that I, I, I work out and people in my life that know me, um, going throughout the day, I'm going throughout my day, and they say, "Where are you going?" I said, "I get to go to Newbridge today. I get to go. I get to. I get to go. It's I get to go, not that I have to go. I get to go, um, because it's special, you know, in my heart that I get to be able to go." And, and, and do this and, and, you know, interact with the clients and talk to the clients and instill that hope and stuff because they're, they are me. They are me. Right. And right. I see that, you know, somebody was leaving, somebody was leaving the program the other day. And um, I asked one of the clients, I says, said, who, 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 who does he know? I mean, who's he close with? He's close with this person. He's close with that person. And I says, get them together. And we'll go and we'll talk to this guy, right? So they go and they talk to the guy and they tell him the reasons. Well, you got a daughter that's, you know, eight years old. You go out there and you relapse. You've got this, these crimes hanging over your head. If you leave here prematurely, you're going to go to jail, right? And so they do what they can do to be able to get this person to stay, right? Whether it works right. or not, whether it works or not. I told right. my clients that rallied up, that rallied up to talk to him. Afterwards, I said, not only is it important that you're, you're talking to your peer, and trying to encourage him to say, you are talking to yourself as well. You are reinforcing your own recovery by saying the things that you're saying to him. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. That's right. You know, we talk about that pretty frequently, David and I, that um, when you really get down to it, if this is all God, all of it, all of it is created and it is all one. I'm you, you're me, we're both David. We're all just reflections of each other. 
but you make that operative. You actually bring that type of very high-minded, philosophical, ethereal idea, and you bring it down to earth in such a way that it makes it a viable, a viable way to become whole again. It's really impressive, Greg. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, we so appreciate your being here. So, Greg, what's it been like over the past 20 years working with people in recovery? Well, it's cool because, you know, it, it gives you purpose in life. And I think pur purpose is important, you know. Um, yeah, and I mean, it kind of reinforces, you know, you know, what I share with them, you know. The pro, one of the programs that I that I work at, there's, I work at two different. There are two different models. One is a medical model. Um, one is a medical model, and the other one is a uh, is an old thera TC. Is what it is. It's a thera therapeutic community. They they've been around a lot in the 70s and 80s. They're fading out right now. Is um, but anyways, it's behavior modification. It's what it is. So so the right. two programs are totally are totally different. You know. Right. Right. And so yeah. So it's good. So, I mean, when you, when you, when I was working with that model, um, it was important, especially in the therapeutic community, role modeling is very, very important in a therapeutic community. Right. So, you, you know, you, you don't want to do, you know, do what I say, you know, it's more do, do as I do. So the way that you dress, you know, the way that you interact, you know, you do it in a way that you're role modeling for them in a way that if they're able to do this on a daily basis, um, they'll end up getting, you know, they'll end up hopefully living their life that way. They're, they're required after being there 30 days, they're required to come on the floor. That they have to wear a tie and they have to have their pants or crease, iron increase every day. We're talking about this is a guy that's been shooting heroin for 25 years. This is old prankster motorcycle guy that's been, you know, doing methamphetamine for 50 years. And we're trying to teach him, you know, re forget rehabilitation. We're trying to habilitate him. He's, right. never, he's never been habilitated. So right. we need to really, you know, model that and show that, you know, we had to bring a guy. Um, I brought this guy about three years ago. Um, I had to bring him to Walmart and Target um, to get some clothes. He had been incarcerated for over 30 years. Can you imagine that? Wow. 30 years. So he's wow. lost cell phones. Are you kidding me? With cell phone. He could not believe that you could take pictures. He was taking pictures everywhere. The, the, you have a camera on these cell phones. It was incredible. But he had to be brought there and kind of showed what the styles are, what to wear, because he's been locked up all that time. It's really sad. Right. It's really it is sad. It's terrible. Especially with chemical dependency. These people that are locked up. At one point in time, I don't know how long ago, maybe five, five years ago, six years ago, that 80% um, of the people that are incarcerated are incarcerated dealing with some type of um, you know, addiction or, you know, drug use, either selling it or using it and committing crimes while using wow. it. It's really, really sad. It's that terribly it's sad. You know, and Greg, what about the opioid problem with the uh, Oxycontin and all of the problems that we're having and nationwide? Fentanyl. And fentanyl. What about these, these, these huge things? They're almost like a plague right now. Yeah, well, Oxycontin... Um, came out in the late nineties and it, it, you know, and was rampant for a while, you know, it was a drug that was almost equal to being on heroin. Usually the same effect. Wow. So, any, so anyways, um, there was a pharmacy, it was called Purdue Pharma because they were sued down the road. Originally they said that this is less addicting than, you, you know, than whatever, right. What, compared to what, right. Mm -hmm. So anyways, you know, they developed a thing that's called PMP. It's the um, um, pharmacy. Um, it was a way of monitoring pharmacies and how much um, Oxycontin uh, prescriptions there were. To kind of have some kind of watch, watch uh, dog. And so they were able to go back. Uh, Purdue Pharma got sued. They had to pay all that stuff off. And now, like you said, you know, it was it was um, back then it was Oxycontin. And now it has graduated to um, heroin lace fentanyl. And um, there's a lot of it on the um, streets right now. Wow. Um, the, the heroin lace fentanyl. And I have seen... Um, 
I have seen people from in the program that, that, I, that I'm at yeah. way more deaths in the last two years than um, than I had seen. Actually, I have some. Bobby, you got that for me. Um, this right here, I brought a little special effect. Can you see it? Yes. This you hold it a little bit closer. Yeah. Let me just make you full size. Oh, this camera for us. Whoa. This is a Narcan kit, okay? And what Narcan is, is, is the paramedics use it, use it in emergency Bring your camera froze for a minute. Can you hold it up again, please? You see it? Is that good? Yeah, it's good. Thank you, Greg. So now, now what hap what's happening is anybody that gets a prescription of opioids, Vicodin, Oxycontin, Methadone, Fentanyl, whatever they get at, at, at the pharmacy, um, they've got a new thing. They give you a prescription for this. And you, you've got to fill this prescription to have this um, kit. It, with the program I work at now, upon discharge, whether you leave treatment against staff advice or whether you successfully complete treatment, for all opioid users, they are sent away with an Arcan kit um, in hopes of whether you use it on yourself or somebody, you have it on you, and if somebody that you know is OD, it actually has a little, just so people kind of get a little bit of the thing. And look, at everybody... If you're an opiate, opiate user or you know somebody that's an opiate user around you, there's always relapse, there's always um, overdose potential. And this is simple. Can you see this? Yes. Yes, we can see it. This is nasal, okay, which is easier oh, okay. to manage. They have Narcan and this little nasal spray. There's somebody around you overdoses. You take this sucker and you put up the nose and you squeeze down on it. And it puts you, it takes you out of that. Hopefully it takes you out of that, um, of that overdose. Um, so it's, the good thing is, is the streets besides heroin, lace, fentanyl, or fentanyl. Oh my God, that they have to do that now. Oh my goodness. Well, so, I mean, her heroin, lace, fentanyl, or fentanyl, laced heroin, you mean? Heroin, heroin, laced, heroin, laced with fentanyl. Oh, wow. Heroin is laced with fentanyl. And that's how all these people are OD nowadays because they don't know what they're getting. So what's happening now is it's like methamphetamine. You got these backdoor chemists out there that aren't that aren't chemists um, cooking up this concoction with the right ingredients and stuff to make fentanyl. Um, and what they're doing with that is um, they're lacing heroin with it now to make the heroin supposedly more potent, you know, but what they're doing is people are dying. Right. And so it's people that are cooking this, this mind you, um, fentanyl is, is, uh, fentanyl is 80 times stronger than morphine. So that is strong. So you can imagine you're going to trust this backdoor chemist making this fit and all stuff that they're going to lace the heroin with to, you know, stick this in your arm. And that's what's happening. That's what's happening there. It's crazy. It's crazy how it's happening. You know, every, you look around. Yeah, the street, sad. yeah look around the streets, go to San Francisco, go to Oakland. This is my area that I live in. And you have all these homeless encampments and stuff and all these people that are strung out. That's why these Narcon kits are so important you know, whether it's for them or somebody else, and whether if you lose it, you lose, they're out there. The more of them out there, the more lives can possibly be um, saved. Right. It's not a solution, but at least it's something out there that will um, help. Wow. Yeah. Well, wow, that's amazing, Greg. Yeah, wow. Crazy. I'm, really sorry to, I'm really sorry to hear that that's what's going on. That's really, right. you know, there's so many... Uh, I, I don't know. What what do you think? I mean, of these homeless encampments, what's the percentage of people that are addicted there that have some sort of substance abuse issues? Over 50 percent. I, wow. I would probably say 75 to 80 percent, but I, I don't wow. know how many statistics or anything, on, but way over 50 percent, I would guess. I mean, what are you going to wow. do? You're living in a, you're living in a what are you going to do? Especially alcoholism, too. I mean, mm. drinking you know, a 40, getting up in the morning, drinking a 40 ounce, you call them 40s. 40, 40 ounce, you know, beer, whatever the case may be. There's some form of addiction involved in that. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Well, let me see, Greg. I'm going to check the chat here. Let's see if we got any questions for you. 
Yeah, Elmer says here in Thunder Bay, we have the worst opioid uh, problem per capita in Canada. May God Thank bless God. you, prayer. Well, I'm not seeing a whole lot of new. Oh, Greg, what are your thoughts on methadone maintenance therapy? Someone asks. Well, methadone maintenance, um, it's used for different things. It can be, it can be used. Um, it can be used for um, detox off of heroin. Mm -hmm. It's used quite often now for, for, for pain management. It's, it's, it is a, it is a, a form of drug that's used for pain, pain management, you know, um so yeah well the one thing about methadone maintenance too is is that you know as far as harm reduction goes it's it you know you're not you're, you're not at risk to get hiv or you're not at risk to get hepatitis c you know by doing that so it was a lot of harm reduction as far as the addiction you know in lieu of heroin you know right. and a lot of people they have a new thing out i don't know if folks know about it. it's called it's buprenorphine you know, it's called buprenorphine, and what it is is it's um, it's an agonist and it's an antagonist both. So what it does is it keeps you from being. Um, this is for heroin addicts, opiate addicts. It keeps you from being in withdrawal. It fills those receptor sites, but it also, but um, you can't take and go get some heroin and shoot heroin while you're on it because those receptor sites are filled already with that. It binds to the receptor sites. So that's the new thing nowadays. It's the new thing that they're using nowadays. It's so very interesting. interesting. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because it blocks the craving for the drug, but it doesn't change any of the behaviors that made you use in the first place. Well, it depends. You know, uh, you know, if you're on this buprenorphine, and it's usually sublingual, you usually put it under the tongue and it melts. Um, if you're on that in lieu of heroin, um, it, it, it could really impact um, the person because you don't have to go out and hustle every single day. Like I said, I had to get my morning wake up, my get well shot in the morning. Then I had to get my afternoon get well and my evening get well and as many get wells as I can get. Right. More, more, more. I was addicted to more. More. Right. I want more. Um, right. Yeah. So, so you said, how did it, how, what does it impact? It, I think it impacts criminality. You know, I think less crimes because this person doesn't have to go out and steal or, or a woman prostitute or do whatever it is that, that you needed to do to get your money to shoot heroin. So you have this already. Same thing with methadone, too, for people that are using it for maintenance from heroin, that it right. cuts down on the criminality, you know, which is good, right? Right. As far as, as, far as you know, yeah. compared to what, right? Right. You know, better a uh poking the eye with a stick than a poking the right. eye with a sword. That's right. So where are we at right now? Do you mind? You, well, you, Greg, you, it's, it's about time for us to start wrapping up. And I know that you had a handout you'd like to share. Can you share that with the screen share? Yeah, Bob, can you help me? My brother-in-law, Bob, is the uh, technici technician. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. I don't, let's see if we can bring it up. Okay. Um, That's page one. And if I want to get ready to switch, I can let you in. Right. So um, we've, we've got up, we've got the uh, item up. How do we do, turn on the screen when, share? When you hit the screen share and then you choose the, the window that you want to share and uh, hit share. Okay. Share screen. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Ah, got it. You there we go. Yes. There, we go. there, it, there is. it is. We got it. There we go. Perfect. There we go. There's two pages of this, and there's five, as you can actually uh, see. Five. Com I thought this would be good just to kind of leave you with, and, and we'll, we'll make it Davis. We're going to have it downloadable. So after the, uh, this is over later on, you can print it out if you'd like me. If you know somebody that you think might like it, you can print it out and share it with them. And so what it is, is so five common. I wanted to give you something to walk away with. This, you know, could it, be, will be, it will be up tomorrow at alpha omega dot church forward slash download. It's not there yet, but it will be up there by tomorrow. Alpha omega dot church forward slash download. 
Okay, so five common challenges in early recovery. Yeah, I'm not up on the screen. Is it okay? Am I up somewhere or no? Oh, well, yeah. you're here. You're here, Greg. You're, you're on the side. We see you. are on the side. Okay. 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 So these are things that are challenges for anybody in early recovery and anybody now that's thinking about, you know, wanting to be in recovery and cut loose. So um, let me read briefly. Everyone who attempts to stop using substances runs into situations that make it difficult to maintain abstinence. Listed below are the five of the most common situations that are encountered during the first few weeks of treatment or or attempts towards treatment on your own on the outside if you, you're deciding to try to quit um, substances on your own. Next to these pro problems here, not only am I we're going to illustrate what the problem is, um, also there's some new approaches or some thoughts, you know, just thoughts to kick around in your head to say, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so for, okay, this is good because we discussed this one already. Friends and associates who use, okay, you want to continue associate your, the problem is you want to continue association with old friends or friends who use. Okay, new approaches, we talked about this already, right? Try to make new friends at 12-step meetings or mutual self-help groups. Um, participate in new activities, hobbies that will increase your chances of meeting people. Once again, the thing with the 12-step, you're meeting these abstinent people. Plan activities with abstinent friends and family members. Where are you gonna meet these friends, these new friends? 12-step meetings. Okay, then there's anger, inability, irritability. So it talks about a little bit about that. Um, three is substances in the home. You know, it's 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 very normal. I do an intensive outpatient group, which is um, they they're not in a residential a setting. They um, come, you know, four four nights a week for three hours in groups and stuff. And it's not uncommon to have um, a gal in 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 the group that has a husband um, that whether he drinks alcoholically or not, he drinks nevertheless. And so it's hard to have somebody going back to a home that has beer or wine in the refrigerator or hard liquor around. It, 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 it's tough. So what are the approaches? Get rid of all drugs and alcohol. Go figure, right? Ask others from using and drinking at home, um, which is true. If you have a partner, um, that, that, that drinks or uses at home and you're, you're in you treatment yourself, you know, have a conversation with your loved one. Let them know that, you know, it's too hard on you. You know, it's too much of a struggle to have that around. Can you go to page two, Bob? Right here. Yeah. Okay. And the last two are boredom and loneliness. A lot of people feel this way. It's like when you're using, like when I was using, you know, there was a lot of stuff that went on in my life other than using the drug. There was all the excitement of getting over and doing this and doing that, that it became boring. Life became boring and, you, and you're lonely. So stop, stop substance use often means that activities that you did for fun and the people with whom you did them with must be avoided. It's a tough one, right? Put new activities in your schedule. Go back to the activities you enjoyed before your addiction took over. And number three, go figure, develop new friends at 12-step or mutual help meetings. Okay, and then the last one, number five, I run across this all the time. We just went past uh, Christmas and New Year's. And I remember when I was when I first came home in 90, 90, 1998, 1999, and 2000, on New Year's Eve, I made sure my butt – was in bed, ready to sleep at 10 o'clock in the evening. Because Good. All Good the, idea. That was my new approach, right? My new approach was to, to go to bed. Because right. New Year's Eve, all New Year's Eve, for the most part, is a party and um, holiday. Okay, parties, dinners, business meetings, holidays without substance use can be difficult, okay? So what do you do? Have a plan for answering questions about not using. I always recommend, you know, a seltzer water or a 7-Up, you know, and some having something in your hand, even you know what I mean, that you have that oral side. Right, Martinelli, something to I mean, say cheers with. Right. That's right. That's right. And you know what? In the world today, if somebody doesn't drink and they're drinking a Perrier or a Crystal Geyser or whatever, that's you know some some people that's looked at favorably sometimes. Right. But you don't drink. Start your own abstinence celebrations and traditions. You know. Right. Have your own transportation to and from events. Okay. And leave if you get uncomfortable or start feeling deprived. To add to that right there, to add to those special occasions or any occasion, be it, you know, a wedding, a birthday party, whatever, 
um, I recommend um, for somebody going into this in recovery to bring a clean and sober friend with you that, that you know you're close to as your support, you know, right. and to hang out with you. So you that. Or develop a plan, like I said earlier. No going in that if this happens and this happens, I'm just going to leave. You know, I give, my, I give myself permission to leave. Right. So kind of right. put together a plan. That's a big one right there, number five, special occasions. Right. Yes, it right. is. It's huge. It really is. So there's some That's questions here on the bottom of, you know, are, the two questions are, are some of these issues likely to be problems for you in the next few weeks? Which one? How will you handle them? So what it's doing is having you identify what's coming up. You know, I identify, you know, my wife's birthday's in three weeks, whatever it is, and how will you handle So craft together a plan, put together a plan. What do they say? Um, uh, what is it? Planning, failing to plan is planning to fail. You know, right. so plan so plan ahead on those type of things. This was really wonderful, um, David and Leslie. I really, really enjoyed this. It's funny, I want to share with can I like click off this, Bob? Yeah, let's turn off that share screen share now. There we go. I got All it. Right. I got it. We're good. Oh, I got Bob's Bob's pull mine up too. We're good. Okay. Greg, the screen is yours. Okay, let me see what um, um I left my train of thought what I was just going to say. So anyways, um, I guess in closing, you know, thank you for, um, thank, thank you, David, and Leslie for giving me the opportunity, opportunity to do this. Um, it doesn't get any better right now as I'm feeling this and I'm saying this right now to the screen right here and um, reading some of the comments. And, um, some of the comments that were there, it's just, it's just, it's, this is just a beautiful, wonderful thing for me to be able to do this, to be able to share my story with somebody. Am I perfect? Heck no, I'm not perfect. Do I still have issues? Heck yeah, I still have issues. It's called the human condition for crying out loud. Um, That's right. And I got my brother-in-law, Bob, that did this computer stuff for me and pulled these up. I love him to death. He's been so supportive through all this with my you know, with my, my dad, you know, taking care of my dad. And, you know, I told my sister to go back to mom and dad, um, you know, the bonus mom and all that with my mom. I tell clients at work, they found out that my mom had passed and, and you know, they give me their condolences and stuff. And I said, you know what? I said, after all the stuff that I've done in my life and lived, me and my sister were there every step of the way with my mom. And I told my sister, I said, my job right now, I live with my dad, so I'm caretaking with my dad. My sister co, co does that, and my brother in law Bob does that too. Um, I told Lori, I says, I told the clients, I says, you know what? I could not have had more resolve and a better um, sense of closure with my dear mother when she went. And my goal is to do the same exact thing with my father. That's great. Thank you so much, Greg, for coming here and sharing your experience with us. Everybody here really, really enjoyed it. I know they did. And, you know, uh, I want to make a quick announcement just before we, we go, Greg. And that is that mm -hmm. today is the beginning. This is the kickoff. This, this live event is the kickoff of Alpha Omega's new recovery program. Now, my brother is going to be doing, you know, coming back here and doing pastoral counseling and doing groups. Um, this is not the last time that he's going to be here. Next time, we're going to try and have something that's a little bit more friendly to interaction so that you can interact more with Greg, those of you who want to. So this is going to be a monthly thing. Greg is at this point committed to come once a month and we'll see how it develops after that. So anyway, you, if you're not on our mailing list yet, you should be, you need to get there. Um, you can sign up for it by getting our free download at the science of miracles.com, for example, and you get that download and you'll be on our mailing list. And we'll let you know when the next one is and what's going on. We're, we're planning on having something every third Saturday of the month. So it's, we kind of got this carved out for Greg. All right. Well, Greg, thank you so much for being here. Thank we you, really Greg. appreciate your being here. And we'll see you. Bye, Greg. God Bye, bless Greg. you. Thank you so much. Well, let's get a good, good party shot at Greg there. Bye, everybody. All right, and to everybody else, remember, how what is it? Have faith and expect a miracle. <laughs> Thank you.
Alpha. Omega. 